that we have of the glory that is to come. Lord, help us to live as children of the kingdom of heaven, not as children of, of this earth, Lord, but to live a different life so that others see you and see you in us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you. Fill us with your word. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we may be more like Jesus until he returns. We pray this in his name. Amen. So you should have read, and you know that. I'm not going to change that. You should have read. I hope you read. The uh, chapters in Luke this week, that was Luke 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. There are calendars up here. Don't forget the calendars. They've got some of the activities coming up. Don't forget the parables if you want to study more. I am briefly going to take you through the Gospel of Luke this week and the next two weeks. I'm not hitting on everything. There's so much there, there's no way that I can so what I'm trying to do is set up this letter for you so that it intrigues you, so that it gets you started on that task, so that you study God's Word, so that you are an approved workman that rightly handles the Word of Truth, so that you are transformed, that, transformed, that your mind is renewed, that you become more and more like Christ in this world by reading this Gospel. To remind you again, Luke is not a Jew, he's a Greek. He didn't, he didn't have all this training and background. He is a convert who studied thoroughly and wrote this account so that you would know what you believe. That means that you've signed up to become a disciple like Merle talked about. Not just said, oh, I want to be saved or I want to be a Christian. You said, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to follow after Him. I want to deny myself and be like the Master so that I can train others to follow in that. And if that means that I've got to take up a cross, an instrument of suffering and pain and execution and death then so be it, because that is worth more than living my life for myself. Thy kingdom come, Father. Thy will be done. So this is for those who have decided to do that. I hope that's every one of you. And this is so that you know what you believe, what you've been taught, what you're supposed to put into action, so that you can live a life that is different a life that is like Christ in this world, a life that is a light to others, a life that so when you meet Jesus face to face, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. This is Luke. He's a doctor. He gave up the world for the fame and the glory and the money of being a doctor, and he traveled around with Paul and was put in prison half the time. He didn't care about his own life. He cared about preaching the gospel message, and this is not a Jew. This is a Greek who wrote Luke New Testament. So we're in Luke chapter 8, even though you didn't read it last week because I didn't make it there. And I want to stress to you again what we're going to see in these next chapters. I want to make it through 13 verse 9, hopefully. Thy kingdom come. Not my kingdom. I've got to change that way of thinking. It's not about me, all the things that I can gain in this earth. If I am rich in this earth, it's so that I can be rich to others. And you should be thinking about the things you read this week with what I'm saying right there. That Jesus' mission needs to become my mission. It has to be my mission if I am, in fact, a disciple. If not, I'm probably not a disciple. I'm a hypocrite instead, and I'm fooling myself. If I have prodigal forgiveness, this lavish forgiveness that almost seems wasteful, that why would anybody die for someone else, especially the unrighteous that mocked Jesus and persecuted Him and spit in His face? Why would, why would the Son of God do that? 
This prodigal grace and forgiveness I have has to lead to a life of my prodigal living by the Holy Spirit to be like God in this world. Something that I could never do before, but through the prodigal outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I can live this way. Being filled, being transformed into the image of Christ so that I am like Christ in this world. And I gather together with you and you and you and you to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, His body literally in this world. While He is in heaven as our advocate, we are here walking the footsteps of Jesus here on earth until He returns. So chapter 8, verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with Him. So we've watched this progression, and at the end of chapter 7, we see this adulterous woman, this shameful woman, this sinner saved by grace at Jesus' feet worshiping. And the religious leaders judge her rather than seeing that she is a sinner saved by grace and they are no more righteous than she is. And they miss the whole point in their own hypocrisy of worshiping Jesus for who He is, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And the twelve are with Him. So we focus on this training now in these chapters. And there are also some women. So you've got the stage set. But there's also a large crowd, verse 4. A large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town. So he told them this parable. Now you're going to get to see more parables coming up in Luke. And I told you that Luke records more parables than any other gospel author. Parables are further teaching illustrations. So if you've got this point, if you've got this concept that Jesus is trying to teach, then he gives this simple story so that you can determine more about it. Say, oh yeah, I see what you mean now. And all you need is this childlike faith to understand that if a farmer goes out and sows seed, he expects to produce a crop. Not that hard to figure out, is it? So you take that out of all the concepts and say that, that, the, that the Word of God has come, salvation has come to man. Why in the world would I not be sowing it if I have this knowledge, if I have this hope? So verse 5, a farmer went out to sow his seed. You know the story. I'm not going to get into that because I'd be here all day. I can if you would like for me to, but I don't figure you want me to be here all day. You know that the seed is the Word of God, and you know that there are different soil types. And again, if you just simply look at this parable with childlike faith, you know that there's only one soil type that's worth anything, the one that produces a crop. And it's not up to you how much crop you produce. It's up to you to let the Holy Spirit germinate you and change you. And that means you've got to get buried in the ground and die. And then God will use you to produce a crop. You don't know what it'll be. That's okay. It's not you that does that. That life grows, and we don't even see it at first because it's underneath the soil. And then it pops up, and then the plant produces. And then the church is like a mustard seed. We'll get to that, but not today that grows up to be the largest of the garden variety plants and even birds can come and nest in it. It's, it's structure so big and so strong from this tiny little seed. Verse 8 though, still other seed fell on good soil. There's the good, the, the, what we want. It came up and yielded a crop a, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Does that sound familiar? You're going to be reading Revelation next, and you're going to see that mentioned several times. Because each letter to the church was a, a letter of correction again, pretty much. There's, there's one or two that aren't necessarily that way. But we have to be corrected, because if we don't watch it, and we have to have each other supporting us, then we wind up getting kind of off the path. And once you kind of wander off the path, you go further and further, and it's harder and harder to get back on the path. But Jesus made the path straight. We've just got to follow after Him. We've got to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Jesus. And Luke says daily, whoever has ears, and Luke has understood this, this comes from the Old Testament, that means to hear and obey. If you have ears, then listen and obey. I'll use the analogy that I normally use. Go clean your room and your child doesn't do it, then he didn't really hear you, and he certainly didn't obey, did he? But if you ask him, did you hear me say go clean your room? Yes, I did. Did you go do it, though? Uh, not yet. Then you really didn't hear me. <laughs> and then you have to sometimes bring in the, if you don't clean up your room, here's what's going to happen. 
I don't want that to happen, but the scripture does tell me that my heavenly father will discipline me also if I am his child. So thank goodness for when the discipline does come because I know that I'm his. But I'd rather not be disciplined. I'd rather hear and obey. <clears throat> Verse 9, his disciples asked him what the parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Wow. Wow. To you, the secrets of the kingdom, of the knowledge of the kingdom of God. This new way of thinking that I was created, I am created, to be in a relationship with God, but I sinned, and that separated me from God. And now, not by any of my works, but because of God's grace, Jesus gave up His life to save me. Wow! How can I take this salvation so lightly? It's got to change me. It's got to transform me. And the, God does it through me by the Holy Spirit. I don't do it myself. I just have to be an open vessel for Him to use. But to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. And they concentrate on what the different soil types mean, and who really saved, who's not saved. Why are we talking about this farming in the first place? They just don't understand. Do you understand? And if you understand, are you hearing and obeying? Verse 15, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. It's not easy. You think taking up a cross is easy? That would be ludicrous to think that. That is the most tormentful way, most shameful way of executing a person. And Jesus Christ came at exactly the right time, took that punishment on him, and for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. It wasn't easy. He stayed up all night praying about it. He literally had drops of sweat that had blood in them because his capillaries burst because he was in such stress. But he gladly went to the cross for you and I. By persevering, they produce a crop. No one, childlike faith, lights a lamp and hides it. Pretty simple. Why would I take this knowledge of the kingdom of God and then suppress it or hide it, not tell it, not show the world? And I've got to do that by the way I love God and the way I love others. What do they do? Instead of putting it in a clay jar or putting it under the bed, instead they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. Do your eyes truly see? Verse 18, Therefore consider carefully how you listen. Because if you listen and it goes in one ear and out the other, it really doesn't do any good, does it? Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they, what they, think they have will be taken from them. Now here's a verse that's taken all out of context again. Because you think, because I have these things, God will give me more if I listen. He's talking about the Holy Spirit again, guys. Whenever God is talking about something, He's not necessarily talking about taking this from you. Because in this world, you will have troubles. Jesus did. He's talking about giving you more of Himself so that you will be more like Christ. So that you can face even a cross that is set before you. That you know you're going to die, but you do it because you're obedient to God and you love others. But whoever thinks they have this knowledge, who rely on their own mindset, thinking I'm righteous or whatever it is, or I can live my life however I want to still, or whatever that lie from Satan is, the knowledge that you think you have, <laughs> you're a fool. We'll get to that later because we, we have this story again. So be careful how you listen. And then we drop down a couple verses and Jesus' mothers and brothers come in and he says, no, my mothers and brothers are, verse 21, my mothers and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. You see it all being tied together here? This sower, God, went out to sow his word and if it fell on good soil, you have, soil, you have a noble heart. And you produce a crop because by dying, you produce fruit. And you've got to persevere to do it. It's not an easy task. That's why it's called dying. It's hard to do. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 20, 24. Jesus is in the boat going across the lake. 
whether it's intentional or not, he's going to the other side where there are heathens more, those, are, those that aren't following after the Old Testament, but are the religious that he's leaving behind following after the Old Testament, or are they following after their own desires and stuff again? That's why they're crowds, but few follow him. But he's heading to the other side of the lake, and, the, and a storm comes up, and he gets up and rebukes the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsides, and all was calm. Verse 25. Where is your faith? Tie this together. This is a continuous story. Where is your faith? What keeps us from spreading the gospel message, from letting our light shine more than anything, is our lack of faith. This, it's in the gospels over and over again. It's because I think that if I give this up, how am I going to feed my family? If I do this, then won't people persecute me? And, and look at the troubles I have, whatever it is. Or I'm not equipped. Yes, you are. Why do you lack faith? Where is your faith? The winds obey. Demons obey. What about you? See how we're going through this story? And his disciples, in fear and amazement, they ask one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So I have to throw this in here, but will I obey him? Or will I make excuses? Or will I seek my own will over his will? Will I obey Jesus? Will I hear? I better listen, think about carefully how I am listening. So they get over to the other side of the lake, verse 26. They sail to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he, met a, met, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, if you study, you'll know there are two demon-possessed men, not one. The, go the Gospel of Matthew tells us there are two. And I'm just going to point this out because I want you to think. I want you to listen carefully and think about this story. Mark and Luke only tell us about one man, but he, he is possessed by a legion of demons, a fighting force of demon that's too innumerable to count, too many in number. How's that? <laughs> in number to count. And they recognize who, God, who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. And they know what their future is. And they ask Jesus if they can go into the pigs. And you know what happens? The pigs run off the side of the cliff and go into the sea. And the sea is this sign of darkness, just like what their future is going to hold. We don't know what happens. If they come back, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not part of the story. The story is there's two men, even though Luke only has one. And what happens with the one man? He wants... To follow Jesus, period. Go wherever Jesus goes because what Jesus has done for him. What about the town? The town doesn't want to follow Jesus at all even though they've seen the miracle here and they've seen the man out of bondage who lived in the tombs. Don't forget that. <laughs> Here's the irony. The people that refused Jesus that day still live in the tombs, don't they? They live in death because they can't see the light. They live in darkness and they refuse the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because more than likely they're worried about the monetary loss that they have. They want to seek out the things of this world. We don't, we don't know that for sure, but you can put it together. But the man, one man, he wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus says, no, nope, can't come with me. Your job is to stay here and be a light. Now, the reason I say that is what about the other man? We don't know. But if Luke didn't say anything about the other man whatsoever, and Luke is writing this orderly account, like this doctor's lying it out, I'll tell you, you, you need to do this to stay healthy and this and that. He doesn't mention this other man. So I've got to think, did this other man take what a great gift he had been given, this gift of salvation of eternal life? Because you know Jesus said your sins are forgiven too. He does when he heals somebody and tells them to go sin no more. Did this other man say, no, I'll go with the crowds instead? We don't know. But the other man is not mentioned whatsoever. But one man is mentioned. Though none go with me, still I will follow. And he's a light to that world, and we do not know the crop that was produced. But look at all the story, how it's flowing together. But he was the one seed that would be planted to produce a crop in this world that denied Jesus and didn't want to have any part of him. Will you be the one seed if that's what it takes? 
Though none go with you, will you still follow Jesus? Will you obey him? Listen carefully to these words. When those tending the pigs saw what happened, verse 34, they ran off and reported this to the town and the countryside. They were telling about Jesus even though they didn't believe or didn't want to believe. They saw the miracle. Verse 35, the people went out to see what happened. They had ears, they had eyes, but what would they do with it? And they saw the man sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. Sounds a lot like the woman from the chapter before, doesn't it? Worshiping at the feet of Jesus. But the people there, they were afraid. Why? I told you what I think. I think because they didn't want the cost of following Jesus because we're going to get in the next chapter the cost of following Jesus. If anybody wants to be my disciple, what he must do. Verse 36, those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed men had been cured, or demon-possessed man, but yet they didn't want any part of that. They didn't have any compassion in their heart. They sought money, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Then all the people of the region asked Jesus to leave. What? Even if you don't have the knowledge before and it comes, it comes into you of who Jesus is and you see this mighty miracle and you see compassion and healing, how can you deny that? How can you suppress that? Be careful how you hear and how you listen. Don't let the fear of anything keep you from serving God because guess what? You're going to be living in the tombs. <laughs> And the guy that was not in his right mind and everything, he's been set free. He doesn't live in the tombs anymore. He might still live in that dark land, but he's a light shining in that land. Are you following this story of the Gospel of Luke? <clears throat> Chapter 9. Jesus sends out the twelve. So we're getting now where they've been trained. They see this compassion even in, in these lands where there is, uh, is no light. And Jesus sends out the the uh, 12 to go out and heal. Jesus tells of his sacrificial death and they witness his transformation. But here are Jesus' words in between the transformation and when he sends them out. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily. Remember, Luke has that in. It's in the scripture. It's in the original text. Mark and Matthew do not because Luke is precisely telling you this. He's spelling you out this. You can't just take your blood pressure here and there. You can't just take your medicines here and there. You can't just exercise and watch your cholesterol here and there. You've got to do it daily. He's writing this prescription for you. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross daily and follow me. What do you think happened if that man didn't persevere in that foreign land, the only seed that was there, the only light that was there? If he didn't persevere, if he didn't rely on the power of God to transform him and renew his mind, he would go right back, wouldn't he? He'd be like that soil that fell on the ground, or the seed that fell on the ground and was absorbed up and for a little while flourished, but then when the sun came, the roots got burned up and the plant died. See where we're headed with this? <clears throat> For whosoever wants to save their life, they will lose it. But don't worry. But whoever loses their life for me will save it for all eternity. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self or their soul? Don't miss that point. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels because that day will come. Where will you be standing? Will you be standing firmly on the rock, which is Jesus Christ? Or will you be tossed around in the waves and the sea because if that's where you are, you're going to sink down into the bottom in the darkness? <clears throat> Jesus predicts his death and the disciples argue over who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's amazing to me that Jesus doesn't reprimand them because he, that he doesn't not want them to be great in the kingdom of heaven. He wants them to be great in the kingdom of heaven. But that means you need to be the least of these. 
You need to be willing if you're the only man in this foreign land to let your light shine before them that they see your good deeds, that they hear your testimony. I once was lost and once was found, and now I'm found. I was possessed by this legion of demons, and there's this other guy that was too, but you see he, he's gone about his path. I'm putting that in there. That's not in Scripture. That's why I'm putting it there for you to think about because he's, it's not recorded. What will you do? The story is about what will you do with Jesus. You say you believe. If you believe, Luke is writing this orderly account so that you're certain of what you believe, so that you'll behave like that, so that you will live like the Acts church. Are you doing that? <clears throat> Instead, he tells them what to do. Verse 47, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least among you, among you all who is the greatest. Will you give up everything to follow Jesus? Will you hear his words and be obedient? Does this great salvation that has been offered to you mean more than anything that this world can provide you? Because if it doesn't, why would you want to gain this whole world but lose or forfeit your very own soul? Jesus heads out to Jerusalem because he's heading out to his death. He knows that he's going to his death. Um, Nathan sent me a little video this week, and I have no idea what the purpose was or anything, but this guy was talking about the death of Jesus. And it sounded like, I don't know if it was, maybe it was even making fun or whatever, but it was talking about being the most gruesome, horrific thing there, there ever was. An innocent man. The world knew he was innocent. He did nothing wrong. The way he was uh, beat and whipped and tortured and the Roman uh, execution of a cross, what that meant and everything else. But I texted back Nathan. I said, didn't tell the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that's why Jesus came to earth in the first place. That he knew the cross laid before him. He knew he would be betrayed by his friends and everything else. And yet he did because he wanted to restore you into a right relationship with God. Not only so that you could be restored, but that you could cry out to him as Father. We're going to get to that in just a minute. That was blasphemous. You don't call God Father. You don't speak his name. But you and I can cry out Daddy. That's what the word means. Because we have a Father in heaven that cares much more for us than any good father on this earth could ever care for us. And don't good fathers take care of their children and want the best for them? There's where we're leading in the story. So he heads out to Jerusalem, and John and James don't get it yet. They literally ask, do you want us to rain down fire from heaven because the Samaritans don't want Jesus to come through there unless he's going to stay and feed them and cure them and everything else. But it's Jesus' time. His time has come now, and he's got to head to Jerusalem. So Luke deliberately writes again about the cost of following Jesus because three different individuals get up and say, I'll follow you. And Jesus knows their heart. You can't fool him. Will they really follow him? And I'm going to not go into what is said each time, but tell you basically what you've got to be willing to do. Number one, you need to be willing to give up everything on this earth. Not even have a place to lay your head. That's what Jesus' first answer was, basically. Number two is you can't be concerned about physical death. It may cost you, but your physical death is nothing compared to spiritual death for all eternity. So lose your life to gain eternal life. And number three, Jesus means what he says. When he says it, it's a commandment from the king of kings. You understand about kings and your allegiance to them. He is the king of all kings. And when he says do this, that means do it. Not your way, his way, not later, now. Clean your room. That means go clean it, right? It's exactly what it means. You don't need to put anything else with it. That's understood. In verse 62, Jesus says this, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back, longingly looks back at what they gave up, they're not fit for service in the kingdom of God. And if you're not serving in the kingdom of God, if you're not willing to be His disciple and train up to be like Him, then probably you're not going to be part of the kingdom of God. 
Time to ponder my relationship with Jesus. Where am I at? Do I belong to the kingdom of God? Do I truly believe? Am I serving Him? Am I letting anything keep me, hinder me? Are there any sins entangling me? I, I'm running a race, so I need to strip all this away so that I can run effectively. And I'm running with you or I, and you and you and you. So what do I need to do to help you? And what do you need to do to help me to run this race so that none of us falls behind? So that we all obtain the goal? So that we run well? Or do I just think that I'm right? Because I know who Jesus is. The gate is small and few find it. But broad is the path that leads to destruction. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, and He will say back to them, I don't know you. But we did mighty deeds in your name. Jesus, I don't know you. Depart from me. Do you know Jesus. Here's where you're at in the story of Luke, and I, I pray that you are studying as you go through, that you study these other parables. I, I can't be there with you each day of the week reading and studying. All I can do is try my best to lead and motivate you on Sunday and to, to be that example the best I can. And I fall short, so I need you just the same. When your example's lighting, lighting up the way for me, it helps so much also. We are on this team, if we put it that way, together. And we fight spiritual battles and Satan is trying to destroy us and keep us ineffective if we are saved. So let's fight this race well. Chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples. See the pattern here? In verse 17, the 72 return with joy and say, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. That is great news. Wow. Wow. But in verse 20, Jesus says, However, do not rejoice that spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You may not cast out demons. That may not be part of what is said on that day when you meet Jesus face to face. But if He says, I love you, thank you for loving me and giving your life for me, then you've got nothing to worry about. You are God's child, Jesus' brother or sister and you will spend eternity with him. But don't miss this, verse 21. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. That's how Jesus walked in the flesh. Through the Holy Spirit, he was given joy for the things that he had to face. And he said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise. If you think you are smart, if you think you have wisdom, you better check it again. And you have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for that is what you're pleased to do. So now I'll give you a more grown-up example than the little kids there. Well, I think I'll take it back to a little kid, too. Love your enemies. Oh, I can't do that. Okay, take the little child again. And he, he just gets in the fight right here. And two minutes later, they're buddies again. Because he keeps no records of wrong or anything else. And if the one apologizes to the other, they accept it for, for that. They don't have enemies as a little child. As we grow bigger and get wiser and smarter, then we hold these records of wrongs and everything else. And we think we're better than someone else. And it's hard for us to love even our enemies. So when they do slap us on the cheek, we don't turn the other cheek. We slap them back. Right? In Jesus' name. Oh, what if Jesus would have done that? I know you say, I'm not Jesus. Well, he commanded you to be like him. He went silent, which is one of the things that I told Nathan before his accusers. He didn't need to prove anything. He, he had already done mighty miracles by the power of God. And if people didn't believe that, they're not going to believe anything now. And the biggest sign that he said he was going to give them is the sign of Jonah. And that's to come out of the tomb in three days. And yet... Still, people want to dismiss that. The resurrection gives you the hope that you have, that you will have eternal life, and that you know that hope is without a doubt. So proclaim that hope that you have. <clears throat> if you're not being prodigally filled and not being prodigally transformed, maybe you need to prodigally repent. How's that? 
parable of someone who didn't think that he was good, but was proved as good by what he did comes up. You know what that is? That's the parable of the Good Samaritan, or the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest couldn't get over not loving his enemy, could he? Neither could the Levite. But the Samaritan, who did not know God's way, automatically gave compassion and love because it was the right thing to do. So this religious leader that asked this, trying to trap Jesus and everything, Jesus tells him, what, which one's the right answer? And he says, well, the one that showed compassion. And Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. Turn that other cheek. Because more than likely, the man that was on the road what, that was hurt was a Jew. He was the en enemy of the Samaritan because of where the location is and what the story is telling you. doesn't tell you per se that he is but more than likely. And the man was even willing to take money to pay for his needs and then was going to come back and see if he needed to pay more money. Martha, Martha, Martha. Why do you worry about the work that needs to be done? If you worship, the work will come naturally. I don't know the motivation of this man's heart, the Samaritan. But he knew what was right in his heart. And he's so much closer to the kingdom of God than the religious, pious hi hypocrites. Do you see this in the story? Chapter 11. If I have been chosen to be a disciple of Jesus, then I need to learn how to pray, don't I? Because I don't need to rely on my own self. I need to be taught how to pray so that that permeates who I am. So Jesus' disciples ask him how to pray. They didn't necessarily have the right mindset. They wanted it like the disciples of John did and so forth. But Jesus is telling us how to pray because He is God's one and only Son. He is God. He, came, he gave up heaven to do God's will and to lay down His life for His friend. And that's who we're supposed to pattern our life after. So when you pray, verse 2, you say this, Father, and I've already told you that was audacious, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Let your name be honored and your kingdom come, which is the kingdom of heaven, the new heaven and new earth being restored. Let that come because that's what we want. Give us each day our daily bread so that we can be t content. And that actually means, it can, it can mean today's bread or tomorrow's bread. That I'm not going to worry about either one and all I need is one day's worth to be satisfied, to be secure because I know you'll provide me with the next and the next. And the next, because it's not what I do. If I do work for it, you've given me the ability to go out and work in the first place. Because I could wake up this morning and not be in my right mind, possessed by demons, anything else, living in the tombs. But by God's grace, I'm not, so I better live my life to bring you glory. So forgive me of my sins, forgive us of our sins, for we also forgive everyone who has sinned against us, even our enemies. And also, not, and also lead us not into temptation that we may fall in. Not all temptations, not take everything away from us, but this temptation that will snare me. Because I want your will to be, to be done and your kingdom to come. So I need you to be my guide, to straighten my path every single day. And I need to walk in step with the Holy Spirit to do this. <clears throat> We fight a spiritual battle every single day against principalities and powers that we can't see waging for our soul and the souls of others. And we have signed up to be a disciple of Jesus or we haven't. And the more that we're doing for Jesus is not the easier it's going to be. The more we will suffer because we're like Christ. The more that we have to persevere. The more that we need one another. The more that we need God's Word. The more that we need prayer. The more that we need to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit each and every day. Jesus set the example in how He lived and how He prayed. So don't forget that. <clears throat> so Jesus tells them a parable to further explain this. And it's about the guy who goes late at night and says, Give me some bread. Bread. Give me a, a lot of bread, more than I probably need. Give me some bread because I've got guests. I want to share it with them. I want to feed them. Give me some bread. And he gets up, go away, it's late. My children, my family are in bed, go away. But you keep on asking, you keep on seeking, you keep on knocking. It's a continuous. 
It's every day. It doesn't stop because eventually that neighbor will answer you. If that neighbor will answer you, how much more will your heavenly Father answer you and give you the Holy Spirit so that you can do this? So that His will be done, His kingdom come, so that I can love even my enemies and be satisfied with what I have each and every day, knowing that eternal life is so much greater than anything that this earth can offer me. Abba, I can cry out to my daddy knowing that he is perfect, knowing that he wants to give me good gifts, knowing that he will never forsake me and that he will give me everything I need to walk as his child here on earth. A divided kingdom cannot stand, can it? There's no way. A divided kingdom will fall. They're talking about Jesus here and the power that he casts out demons and does other things, but the message here is, are you divided in your allegiance? Or have you pledged your full allegiance to Jesus Christ? Let him light you so that you can be a light. Woe to you if you work for your own abilities and your own praise or anything else. If you clean the outside to look good, but you don't clean the inside, woe to you. Love prodigally God and others because you were prodigally loved. This is the story that Luke is, is writing for us. Chapter 12. Beware, though. Be on your guard all the time because Satan will fight his battle so many times through others who proclaim the name of Jesus who say they're righteous, but yet are the blind leading the blind, who throw snares out there for you because they might teach you this other type of gospel that you need Jesus plus circumcision, that you've got Jesus so you're fine. You can live your life the way you want to right now. I know you've got these things in your life right now. Serve Him later. Those are lies. You have been equipped by the Holy Spirit to be Jesus' witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You don't need to worry about anything else. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Your calling may simply be to go right back where you came out of the tombs and tell people there what Jesus has done for you. Does it mean you're going to be called to a foreign land? That's one of the fears that keeps people. If I say, Jesus, you've got all of me, then he'll want me to do all this. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But if you don't say, I'm giving him all of myself, did you really give him any? Because you can't serve two masters, and you will serve one or the other. And if you're not with Jesus, you're against Jesus. And if you're not producing and gathering... You're scattering instead. <clears throat> but I will show you, verse 5 of chapter 12, who you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you. That means again, listen up. Careful how you listen. Fear him. But you don't have to fear if you're in the right relationship because of Jesus Christ. Because are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many, many sparrows. And if these words seem familiar, you read them back a few chapters ago. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others. you remember on Merle? He read them in chapter 9. The Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God, but whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. Why do you think Luke wrote these words again unless he's trying to get it into your head how you should listen and obey? Verse 10, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And you can take that however you want to, and that's another topic we can preach on wherever. But if the Holy Spirit is talking to you, saying, love your enemy, and I'm not pointing at you because you don't. It's because it's one of the things that Merle and I talk about that are hard. And you're not listening to him? I'm not going to say you're blaspheming because I'm not going to get onto a different religious topic, but you're not listening to him, are you? So your mind is not being... Uh, 
uh, regenerated, and you're not being transformed, renewed was the word I was looking for. And you're not becoming more like Christ because you're letting this sin entangle you or whatever it is. Listen, those who have ears, let them listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. So as we read on down a little bit further, we get this story of this rich man who is distracted by the things of the world, who thinks in his own mind that he has worked good, he has produced what he has, and that's why he has what he has. But he doesn't give God glory to God, he's not thankful to God, and he doesn't give to others. And what happens? Verse 20, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. The wages of sin is death. I work for a wage, therefore I should get paid. But the wages of sin, not loving God and thanking Him for it, and not being thankful for others, is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The total opposite. This is how it will be, verse 21, with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. And the way that he could have been rich towards God would have been thanking God and giving the food that he had to feed others. If you don't have ears to understand, you'll never understand the teaching because you won't understand the parable that's a further teaching illustration. So don't worry. Be dressed, be ready, be waiting, be working, and you have nothing to fear whatsoever. Prodigally love and serve God and others. This is the way of discipleship. You won't be divided. Your kingdom will stand. Your kingdom is God's kingdom, and it will come, and you will be doing His will. So let the Holy Spirit change you, transform you. If you're smart enough to know the weather and know to get out of the rain when there's a thunderstorm, then you should be smart enough to figure this out. That's the end of that chapter, prayer phrased by Alan, big time. <laughs> chapter 13. Beware in this world, bad things will happen. So don't think because the bad thing happened over here, you're living righteously. Bad things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen because this world has been fallen into a sinful state. And if you read Genesis and you read Revelation, you'll see that it was perfect before and it's going to be even more perfect, if I can throw that in there, because it's not more perfect, don't get me wrong. But what Revelation talks about, there's not a tree anymore. There's two trees. It produces a different crop. Off that. It's so much better for us to look forward to. It's perfect in the beginning, so don't take my words out of context in what I'm saying. Don't we want to long for that and live for that? Yeah. So we live to make that kingdom come, to have God's will be done, that it is His will for all men to be saved. And if that means we've got to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow after Him, then that's what a disciple must do, not should do, must do. Anyone who truly repents is a true believer. And Jesus will guide you through the Holy Spirit and through the Word and through prayer to be His disciple, to be like Christ, to usher in God's kingdom. One last parable for you to think about, and this is where I'm closing today. Then we'll get to, through the rest of Luke in the next two weeks. A man had a fig tree, this is verse 6 of chapter 13, growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. What is being produced in your life? You see the story? You can't miss it when it's explained this way. And you should get it already, and you should go study, and you should see all these things. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been looking to, I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Now you can take this and tear this all apart and say this goes back to the people of Israel and Jesus did preach for three years. Yes, but the, the point is, is you in this story. Not the Israelites, not the Pharisees. You. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ doing His will? 
or are you a hypocrite? And you take the chance on what soil type you are and where, you, where you'll be for all eternity. Because even a child knows the only good soil is the one that produces. You want to risk being one of the other soil types? Go right ahead. But the others didn't produce fruit. So what good were they? Whether they lasted for a little while and then withered away and died, the only good crop is the one that produced because they died to produce. Go read John chapter 12 where Jesus says that you must die. He's saying this about himself, but it applies to us again, that without dying to ourselves, a, a crop will never be produced. So the <clears throat> man who on the garden said, I haven't found any fruit, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? We're right back to where we started with this parable. A farmer going out to sow seed. You might think you're good soil, but if you're not producing a crop, then you're not good soil. There's rocks that need to be got out. There's hard pack that needs to be got out. There's, there's watering and nurturing that needs to take place, which is what, God, what, what Jesus says here. Verse 8, Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it. And I'll fertilize it. And if it bears fruit the next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Which one will you choose? Are you Jesus' disciple or not? Are you saved by grace through faith? Do your works of repentance show that you are? The way that you love God and love others, even to the point of laying down your life for them, is that what your life shows? Because that's what Jesus shows. And if He is your master, if He is your king, then you are saved and the Holy Spirit was given to you to reveal you all truth, to seal you for that day, to renew your mind, to transform you from a caterpillar to a butterfly. I'm excited about Kim's journey because that's what we're going to talk about, this tremendous change that these young girls can see in their lives because they love Jesus and they let Him live through them by the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't matter what they think they are now, they will become this beautiful creation, this new creation in Christ, if they'll only let Him be King and Lord of their life. So what will you do? Are you bearing fruit? The thing is, is we don't know when that year is going to come up and our life is going to be required of us. We don't want to be that fool who is not rich towards God and rich towards others. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for these words that Luke wrote down in his gospel. Lord, help us to study your word. Help us to not live off of earthly bread, but to live off of your word as the bread of life. For Jesus is the bread of life. May we feed off of him continuously so that we can be like him. Lord, we thank you that you have come to abide and tabernacle with us, to live in us, that we are priests offering up spiritual sacrifices. And that doesn't mean it's easy. That means it is costly. Jesus even told us repeatedly to count up the cost, but it would be worth it. For what would it profit a man to gain everything in this world but lose his own soul? And Lord, we thank you for the temptation of Jesus that we have earlier in Luke and to know that he faced these same temptations, but he told Satan to depart from him. Lord, we have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us and we can say the same thing. We can say to these evil forces, depart from us. We can put on your armor so that we can fight this battle. It's not our battle. It's not our armor. It's yours and the victory is already won through Jesus Christ. So help us to live as though we truly believe that. We pray this in His name. Amen.